Hello, listener. Welcome to podcast number 105. And you've uh, got the pleasure of my company today because Hev's still travelling around North America. I'm joined by the lovely Rachel. Thank you, Rich. Hello. Hello. And the lovely Phil. Or probably not quite it's, so uh, lovely. Yeah, that's right. His loveliness is easily covered up with a, a crust of uh, cow manure. But well, I've just been in my <laughs> maternity <laughs> unit, so um, yes, nearly lovely. Uh, it's good to see you both. It's good to see you. Rach, what's Hev been up to? Oh, Hev, right. Update on Hev's travels throughout the USA. Well, she's heading up the, the West Coast and she's going north. She's just above San Francisco at the moment and she's been visiting various places along the way, including the Benzinga Winery. So I think oh, dear. Yeah, that, I think so. uh, that, that just, yeah. that yeah. just sounds like yeah, a match a, made in hell. It, it said on yeah. a blog that she'd bought three bottles of wine, Phil, but she's there on her own, so I'm a bit worried what's going to happen. Well, it's not likely to work, is it? No, I? no, no, definitely no, not. No, no. Yeah, um, But she sent us some stuff to listen to. She has, yep. You'll be hearing in future shows the adventures of Hev. But you can follow her. If you go to heathergorringe.com, she's got a great blog there telling you all about her adventures. It's really worth following because it's good. OK, fantastic. And we've got a little soundbite from her now, I think, a few minutes of the latest Hev adventure. Hi all, (laughs) that's my American voice. Uh, It's Heather using the Ricardo roving microphone thingamajig as I tour my way around America. Uh, You can follow my journey at www.heathergorringe.com and you'll see that I started at the Podcast and New Media Expo on into LA to the farmer's market and then started to head up the coast to Santa Barbara and then yesterday I ended up at Paso Robles a small town, small farming community actually it was famous for almonds but we'll hear about that shortly very much wine making country and I was lucky enough to see many things I'd never seen before. It was rather like a boatside vintage rally in the sense that they had lots of chugging machines and thrashing boxes and they had the branding irons out, putting the marks onto wood and all sorts of things, including the the Wild West wagons. But I saw butter making. My mum used to make butter and I saw them making butter in a thing called a Maytag which was actually a washing machine, which had loads of attachments, like my KitchenAid. And one of the attachments was for making butter. And you could make butter in 15 minutes. And I went and tasted it. It was delicious on some fresh bread. Anyway, I was lucky enough to meet up with Paul Ernst, who was organising the event, whose family were one of the first to come over and set up their homestead in the area of Paso Robles. So here we go, let's have a listen in. Dear Wiggly listener, I'm with Paul Ernst and he's a farmer from, how do you say the name of this place? Paso Robles. Okay. Paul, I'm on a Nuffield scholarship, which was a guy called uh, Mr Nuffield, came over to the States many, many, many years ago and stole your tractor technology. (laughs) He went home and built the Nuffield tractor and became a million squillionaire. And he set up a scholarship fund to let 20 farmers go around the world every year and find out something about new technologies or new ideas that could be brought back because he figured that farmers weren't actually getting out and about. So I'm one of those farmers this year. And my subject is Web 2.0 and social media. Now that is about using the internet to connect are you online? Yes, I use the inter- internet to buy and sell stuff. Tractors, eBay, uh, Craigslist. There's a ZZ Star, which is a local list. I've sold skip loaders and stuff on that also. Yes, farmers use it quite a lot of times for research or cattle prices, uh, grain prices. Yes, I think uh, many farmers use the internet around here. What percentage of farmers would you think in your area would have an email address? I would say at least half. Yeah. Um, in England, it's probably less than a third. Really? Yeah. we got to catch up. Well. Um, so tell me about today, Paul. This is a 
day that was started to give recognition to farmers is, is the way it was started. In the years past, all the farmers would get together in the downtown city park, and now it's not so much that. It's mainly a day to show off the old tractors, particularly the track layer tractors, the caterpillars. Now, I've just phoned my brother Billy because he is a caterpillar driver, and so I was able to read out the names of all the diggers and all the, the track layer machines right. to him over the phone, and he would tell me how they worked and all that sort of thing. But the thing that intrigues me is you're a farmer, and so is this day to celebrate when those farmers first arrived here as well? That's correct. My family on my father's side arrived here in the 1880s. On my mother's side, I think the late 1880s, and we've been farmers here ever since. And what do you farm? Generally dry land grains, barley and wheat, and some hay, and we also have cattle. Because I noticed there's a big hoo-ha about almonds. Yes, almonds used to be a huge cash crop in Paso Robles in the 19, about 1910 through the 1920s. A lot of it started, there were developers that sold people from the Midwest of the, of the United States 10-acre parcels and said that they could retire on the proceeds, which was, which was a lie. Really? And so it was really kind of a, a great big... Um, boondoggle on the whole thing so it lasted about 20 years but at one time this was the almond capital of the world really but now most of the almonds are grown in the san joaquin valley under irrigation these were all dry land almonds that were here so what went wrong was it just that it was too dry here it was too dry it was too steep and they couldn't make enough money and so now it's mostly wine probably wine grapes and cattle are the two biggest cash crops in san luis obispo county yeah and your family, when they arrived here, you know, I've watched the cowboys on the telly. And, you know, with those um, wagons, and everyone comes over the hill, and it's just a complete celebration. Is that true? Yes, but my family arrived by train. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And where did they come from? They came from Geneseo, Illinois, and they founded Geneseo, California, which is where this schoolhouse that, that's out here is from, is Geneseo. It's no longer a, a, a little town. It's just a spot in the road out there now. But they founded Geneseo, California, and they came from Geneseo, Illinois, on my father's side. Wow. And what is it like now to be a farmer? Is it the same as in the UK in the sense that our sense of self-worth has probably gone down over the years? Or are you well admired by your I think, fellow I think farmers are still respected. It's a difficult business. It's, it's the ultimate entrepreneurial that uh, a farmer has to be. And it's very difficult in California because of all the regulations that are placed on them. Probably much so is it in the UK you know, pesticide regulations and things like that. So it's, it's a difficult business to be in, but it's a very rewarding business still. And who do you sell your cattle to? We sell them at a local market, a Templeton Livestock Market. And what size farm have you got? We have about 2,000 acres, but much of our farm is in a program run by the United States Department of Agriculture where they pay us not to farm it because it's very steep ground that's highly erodible. And so we get paid a certain amount a year not to farm it right now. Really? Yes. And how does that go down with you? Well, we make more money doing that than farming it. Yeah. Is the honest truth. Yeah. You know, we don't like it, but the money's too good to pass up. And what about all this stuff? You know, in here, it's like going back in time to exactly how when I watched The Virginian on the telly, Yes, it was. Everything in this building and all the buildings and all the ground is donated material. Many of the families have donated stuff. We have stuff that we've donated, but most of the, the Pioneer families have donated material here. And it's been a community effort, which never would have happened, but a, there was a banker, a Mr. Ford, that started the whole process rolling. He started storing some of this stuff, and it just grew from there. And now we have over 20,000 square feet under roof. And people come here and reminisce a lot. It's amazing. What do you think about what's happened to California over those years? I've been in L.A., and it seems to me that there isn't much greenery left. There's still a lot of open space if you get off the main freeways, but the population of California has exploded, and there's a lot of pressure on agriculture due to urban areas encroaching on agricultural land. So it is, it is a problem in California. 
And do you still love living here? I've lived other places, and this is a beautiful place still to live. Yeah. Now, my last question is a very serious question, so get your serious head on. What I want to know is, why do farmers wear baseball caps instead of cowboy hats now? They don't blow off so easy. <laughs> is that it? Because <laughs> you ruined my image of a cowboy. <laughs> There's still cowboys here. Even a lot of the ca- cattlemen wear ball caps. And how do you round up your cattle? Use an ATV. Yeah. That's but there are a- still a lot of people that use horses here. But I, I, we generally use Jeeps and ATVs. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. OK, great stuff. Thanks, Heb. Phil, what have you been up to? What, uh, what are the latest adventures on the Phil front? Well, we've been planting. We're sort of getting towards the end of planting. Has so it been a good autumn for you? Cause it well, it has really. To have been. It's quite interesting because the actual soil conditions are very strange because of all that rain we had yeah, earlier on yeah, in you, the summer. You mentioned there was it's very, active. very odd how tight the ground is. Right. I, I did a talk last night down at the Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust. And I did a couple of farmers there, and not, it's not often you get farmers when you do talks about Garden of the Wildlife, so I was quite pleased with that. And they were great blokes, and they came out to me afterwards and said they, they introduced themselves and whatnot. And the one guy was just doing, he's just setting up a new worm farming enterprise, and he mm. wanted to gleam a little bit of gen about worm farming and stuff. And they mentioned about the floods that they'd had. Mm. Of course, we had these mad floods, and they, they live on a floodplain. I think they do a lot of sheep farming and stuff like that, mm. and their house was flooded. But the guy said that after the floods, there were tens of thousands of dead worms yeah. on the surface of the ground. If you flood the soil, I mean, the, the little bit of land we've got down at the river suffers the same problem. So the, the river covers it over, and depending on how long it covers it over depends on how much damage it does. But it will completely wipe out the earthworms. Yeah. Obviously, the eggs survive, right. but when we plough that ground, yeah. you don't very often see very many big worms, but you oh. might see quite a lot of juveniles, okay. which is probably, you know, it might get flooded at least once a year for a, a greater or lesser length of time. Do you think it would matter whether it was flooded? I mean, presumably, because they, that ground is not used to being flooded in the summertime, then it would be, have a different impact than what it does in the winter, which is usually flooded. Could do, although I, I, I couldn't really sort of suspect that that would worry things like worms, right. because they're in the soil all the time. But it would, and almost certainly did, devastate things like ground-nesting birds on yeah, the floodplains. Sure. That yeah. would have completely decimated those. And it also, I gather, because of all the sludge and crud that it left, it completely transformed the, the insect spectrum because you would got all this detritus and everything that, that, and then we've had that sort of warm summer. Yeah. You know, we've all said the quantity of flies and midges are around much later in the year and that, that I gather, is worse where the floods were, where there's all this slime and sludge because some, some of these fields ended up with sort of three or four inches of virtually liquid mud yeah. just put over the top of them. Which I, I guess is why, but I mean, blue tongue, of course, that's, that's spread by midges, isn't it? So well, that, that's spread by midges. I, I suspect that that is another... Body of water that we've know, had on the country. Warm so. factor, that no, no cold to, to diminish them. But, I mean, I've noticed now, you know, we're ploughing at night, that in the lights of the tractor, there are just clouds and clouds of flies right. around the top of the tractor cab. Right. each evening yeah well yeah. by now i would normally have expected you have to go pretty late at night for them to diminish you know when the, when the temperature drops and they all stop flying around and it, it is, it is things are growing still quite well though, aren't they i'm still picking courgettes and whatnot out of the vegetable patch. Mm. so there was one morning the other morning where there was a bit of rime on the grass first thing in the morning right. but that was as close as we've got to a frost and it's quite interesting you look at some of the crops around here there's quite a lot of maize grown for maize silage and it's still pretty green on the whole, yeah. which for the time of year, it, you know, it, it would be normally starting to turn by now. But do things start to quieten down for you now? Though, once you finish getting your, once you finish planting and seeding. Well, once we get everything planted up, and then the next immediate task is to test the cattle for TB for tuberculosis and wean the calves, and they all go off to Will Morgan next month, beginning right. of November. Right. But once we've done that, then peace and tranquility can descend a little bit, okay. although I've got one or two building jobs. I, I, uh, 
my dear wife has suggested to me that the farmyard <laughs> requires a little concrete. Really? <laughs> a bit tiny Poor old Danny up. driving the forklift across it. It looks like a rodeo as he rides it across <laughs> the bumps. <laughs> yeah, he does. I think he enjoys, yeah. I think he yeah. enjoys that. That's a, that's a new element to it. I don't know. They act quite well as uh, the sleeping policeman for him. So, uh. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm, not sure it, I'm not sure it works in the way it's supposed to. <laughs> no. <laughs> the trouble is, some of the holes in the yard are getting to the point that they're not sleeping policemen. They're like the pits of the world it disappears <laughs> into them never to come out <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to have to do a little bit of that then but that that's generally what we do in the winter time and the cattle come in obviously at the point that we wean them right but we don't start calving officially until the new year okay so that in theory november and december are a bit quieter and more sensible and you're going to go and see hev soon yep yeah, i'm going out to vancouver at the weekend Monty and I are going out. Looking forward to it, actually. Yeah. We, everybody who's been to British Columbia says what a fantastic place it is. Oh, so, I love autumn in there. And yeah, I gather cool. there's a possibility of a bit of whale watching. Wow. So we might go and do some of that. And so there'll be lots to look at there. And then we're going to go over to Podchef Island, right. Shore Island, which is in a group of islands called the Orcasian Islands or off the northwest coast of Washington State. So okay. right, right by there. Yeah. And we're going to go and visit our pod chef, find out what he's up yeah, to. Yeah, he's up. Did have a look on the internet to see what Shore Island or, or Pod Chef Island, as we call it, was like. And yeah. it, it struck me that it's a pretty quiet place. There's, yeah. there's 235 residents. Ding, 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 uh, ding. Well, I, <laughs> I, I, the comment that stuck in my mind was <laughs> that it said, uh, once a visitor leaves the ferry, it's not usually long before they're back on it. <laughs> <laughs> Which, Oh, I'm sure it won't be oh, our, no, the see, case yeah. in, in, on our visit, but yeah, it, it all, struck me that... It's all becoming clear to me. You, you'll have more of an interest, though, at a farmer's view of it and looking at the soil structure of it and things like that, so... I mean, it looks absolutely idyllic, you know, totally peaceful. We're going to cook some pork. That's what we're going to do. Ah, that's right. He's yeah. um, butchered his pigs because he's got all his own produce. We're going to be there for one of his cooking... I was going to say training days, but I don't mean that. It's where he shows us how to cook rare breed pork properly. Excellent. Now, this is the sort of day I I'm can looking live forward with. to that. I'm, mm. Actually, I'm looking forward to that you're using the knowledge that you acquire from that. Absolutely. Day, yeah. I've noticed that our own porkers so are, are getting out there. Um, <laughs> as they can get used to best They're getting effects. a bit of an attitude problem, aren't they? They're, uh, they're getting quite large, aren't they? Perhaps it's nature's way to make things annoying so that you don't mind killing them so much. Yeah, they're very inquisitive, aren't they? You go yeah. out there, and as soon as they hear voices, they come up to the <laughs> gate. <and> yeah, <laughs> that's it. Uh, <laughs> very good, Rich. Yeah. <laughs> the Tamworth gets her head stuck in the gate, yeah. which is hilarious because she sticks it through the hole and obviously as she's grown mm -hmm. her head and gets her ears either side and can't get it out, she just stands there and squeals until you go <laughs> release her. Yeah, I've seen her do that. Well, that's fabulous. Cheers, Phil. I, what what, what we, uh, we'll have to listen to next is your own report from uh, Podchef Island. Yeah, well, we're going to take the relevant equipment and we, we should come up with one or two sound bites, so that'll be good. All right. And then I suppose just briefly, we've got to mention here at home that, that we haven't had any crashes and bangs. I was expecting during this recording a lot of crashes and bangs. We've got Pip and Aidy in the house while Hev's away, yeah. and we've taken the dining room apart. Heather left saying, I'm sure there must be a fireplace behind that wall, behind that cupboard. Have a look while I'm gone. Well, here we are. Aidy and Pip have removed no less than three fireplaces one behind the other, really? and they've got back to the big arched... Well, it would have had a cast-iron range in right. it by the looks of it. Right. The lugs to hang a kettle hanger on it, it may have been that the range was the second thing that was in there. There would have been, like, an open fire. It's difficult to know. It's very hard to research what actually went on in about 1750, which is about the sort of time we're talking about. Yeah. But that's been fascinating. And uh, we've been exploring which chimney pots go with which fireplace and all that sort of caper. So um, poor old Aidy's a bit tired. He's been up and down the ladder up onto the roof as many times as he can manage with buckets of cement and this, that and the other. So Fabulous. we're progressing and we haven't wrecked the joint too badly yet. Good stuff. All right. Well, I reckon that's a wrap, guys. Looks about the job, doesn't it? Yeah, it does, yeah.
all those who are interested, make sure they follow Heather's latest blog, which is detailing what she's up to. It's called Around the World in 80 Megabytes, and you can find it at heathergorringe.com. OK. She's actually taking photos. Unheard of. Yeah, she no, actually, it's actually impressive. found the camera. Yeah, really? I think he's run out of battery now, so yeah, she's gone yeah. back to the photos she, yeah. on the phone. Uh, but, but there was a bit of anyway. trial and error there in the first <laughs> instance. <laughs> Oh, great Yeah, stuff. that's going really well. Okay. Lone woman travelling, she's doing a top job. Yes, because you'll want to go off next, right, won't you? I will, Rich, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, I've got a uh, little itchy go away now. with Heather. Uh, It'd be uh, great, actually, yes. because I'll get rid of both of you then. <laughs> Rich, you'll be on the sofa <laughs> all on your own. What will uh, you do? I want to collapse to. I've got a better idea, Rach. Why don't we all have a party here and export him? <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> True, we could do that. And on that note, <laughs> it's bye-bye from me. And bye-bye from me. And bye from me. <laughs> <laughs>